with Romans chapter 13. I don't know if you remember Romans chapter 12. We'll, you know, review a little bit. But in Romans chapter 13, we see the Christian responsibilities. Uh, Emily, are we live yet? Hey, Amen. All right. So if you're joining us through Facebook, we welcome you. Uh, please pray for Pastor as he's not feeling well tonight. And I know the Lord richly bless you. But we're in Romans chapter 13, and the topic of Romans chapter 13, Paul comes to Christian responsibilities. Now, if you remember, Romans chapter 12 started the practical aspect of the whole book of Romans. So 1 through 11 was the doctrinal aspect, and 12 through 16 is the practical. Now, there is, you know, there, it's doctrinal, but for the most part, um, it uh, applies to the practical Christian life. In chapter 12, Saul created to God first in verses 1 through 2. And then we saw in verses 3 through 8 in chapter 12 to humble ourselves in our church. What's our Christian walk to be towards God? What's our Christian walk to be towards the church? And we see that in 3 through 8. In 9 through 21 of Romans chapter 12, we saw love one another in our lives and in the church. So really, chapter 13 is an overflow of this thought of how to act as a Christian, how to act towards one, towards another. In chapter 13, we're going to look at three different divisions that he brings up. He talks about being the Christian citizen, the Christian in debt, and the Christian incentive. And so these are the Christian responsibilities uh, which Paul brings out in chapter 13. Let's have a word of prayer before we start. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your forgiveness, Father, through your Son. We do pray your blessings upon your word that you'll open up our hearts and that you'll instruct us and guide us, Father, according to your will, where we may bring you praise and glory. We do pray, Father, for those who are not well or, Father, who are afflicted, Lord, and we do pray that you'll give them your grace, and we know, Father, you will, for you loved us, Father, and we, we know that you do. And thank you, Father, for the ones who are here tonight. Thank you for the ones who may be listening to the broadcast. Uh, we do pray your blessings again. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm looking at that fan. Is that fan plugged in? I think I might... Uh, Go over to this fan over here real quick. It's a good thing I got the lapel on so you can... Uh, yeah, that fan. That's okay. The lapel's not on? Why is it not on? Well, it might need to turn it on. <laughs> so, anyway. No fan. Let's just go. Let's do it like the old times. Thank you, brother. I, I can scoot this over to. <laughs> no. And they that resist shall receive to themselves the damnation. So we see that from verses 1 through 2 that the governments are of God. They're ordained of God. And brother, I like what Brother Heisel says that uh, Jesus and Paul, we see uh, heed to this all the time. No honest Christian is a troublemaker with the authorities. No honest Christian is an, a, a troublemaker with the authorities. And we've said before and many times that a Christian should be any nation's best citizen. Now, we see that if you resist, that you're, res you're resisting the ordinance of God. If you don't, now we will talk about when there is just reason to resist the government. But if they are, you know, they're not breaking God's law, then we are to be subject. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, we see this principle taught as well. 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be 
to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but the servants of God. Now, when we submit ourselves into the governors, you know, the ordinances of God that he has established, the government, you are demonstrating yourselves to be to live peaceably with all men, right? So uh, I never really understood the people who blow up abortion clinics and they say that they're doing in the name of religion. That that's not Christianity, blowing up um, abortion clinics. Rebellion against government is indeed rebellion against God and shall endure the punishment of the government and be judged by God. In Acts 23, this was Paul's attitude. And when he was reviled against the high he reviled against the high priest and he apologized and he, had, he did not know that he was the high priest. Um, it says in verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. For, in, in general, for the most part, rulers are there to enforce the law. And when you have somebody breaking the law, it's typically evil. So rulers are not a terror to good works, they're not a terror to those who keep the law, but to the evil ones. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. You know, this is the kind of same attitude that I see sometimes, especially in the younger generation, how they just have a rebellious spirit, even towards adults, uh, towards their parents, towards their teachers, towards um, just, you know, uh, their elders in general. They just have this rebellious, and I mean, if I talk the way that, that some people, young people talk to their parents or their teachers, oh man, I would have... I would have got hurt by my parents. I was scared of the law and the rule that my parents established. And not only that, the, of the school. What if I were to get suspended? So there needs to be a spirit of, of subject. You need to be subject to authority and to the powers that God has ordained. Um, verse 4, now he's still talking about, uh, I'm sorry, verse 3, we, he says, Wilt thou then not... Be afraid of the power, do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. So, you know, it kind of reminds you of Joseph when he came up through Pharaoh, how he had, you know, even though that he was betrayed, and even though he was not an Egyptian, he was, you know, an Israelite, he had the praise of Pharaoh. And because, you know, the Lord had blessed Joseph and all the things which he did, he made Joseph wise in Egypt. And so Joseph had the praise of the government. Even it may have been a completely different government, but he had the praise of the government. Verse 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So you could say, well, I mean, does that mean that God ordained, you know, evil men. No, he's ordained the government. Evil men are evil because they have sin. And he has ordained the government to rule. And so, but as long as it's is in us, as long as it's in us, we live peaceably. Now in verse 5, it says, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. As a general rule, governments again reward the good and punish evil. Unless there's a Bible principle that's been forfeited, we should obey the law of the government. Um, keep your hands here and turn to Acts chapter 5. Unless there is a biblical principle that is being violated, we should obey the law. In Acts chapter 5, you may know where I'm going with this. In Acts chapter 5, Peter had to disobey the government, the government. In chapter five, verse twenty-eight. We'll look at verse twenty-seven. And when they had brought them, 
And they, sat, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. So unless the law of the land is in direct violation with what God has ordered us to do, commanded us to do, we are to obey. But if it does violate the law of the land, we are to obey God rather than man. That's what happened to John Bunyan, you know, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress. He was thrown in jail for preaching. Uh, if, he, if they told him, you know, and they actually even told him, if you would just not preach, you could go home to your, you know, your wife and your family. And he says, I should rather obey God than men. So we see that when chapter 13 of Romans, when it talks about us being subject to the government, I mean, we are the prey for our president. We, we, that doesn't mean we are the agree with what our government's doing or our leaders or, uh, you know, the, uh, I was, I had this, been having this conversation with Jason that, uh, you know, the, America's not perfect. The uh, democracy which we have anywhere you go wherever there's power there's also going to be corruption you know and um, but that doesn't mean that you throw out the whole thing you know because we have the best form of government that there is we have a republic and so our president isn't is not an absolute power like Putin and you know I was looking at the term uh, Putin's been in office has been president for a while and you know what happens when presidents are presidents for a long time? They start worrying about their legacy. So I bet you anything, well, you know, that this Putin thinks, well, if, you know, uh, if I, I need to establish some kind of historic event in my name or do some historic thing in my name because he's been in there too long. It was wise to have term limits and things of that nature, you know, when our country was founded. So... You know, even Paul used the fact that he was a citizen of Rome to get him out of tight situations. Um, the child of God should do things that keep our conscience clear, not just to avoid wrath, but because it's the right thing to do. And that's what he says here in verse 5. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, not just to avoid being punished, but also for conscience sake. And so we know that we are to submit to authority. And that was something that, you know, I was taught, and I know many of you were taught when you were little, to, you know, respect your elders, respect your teachers, respect uh, your pastor, your preacher, your, your president, even respect the office of president, you know. And so um, that is what we are taught to do. In verse 6 it says, for, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. You know, and that's one of the things you, you especially when you start getting into to the political uh, times or the, the the times of where we need to, or the election times, you'll start seeing people who um, believe that, you know, well, Jesus had nothing to do with the government, so, you know, I don't have an opinion, and I don't think that's right. Um, I don't think that's right at all. I think that if we see evil, we declare it as evil, uh, but at the same time, we are, you know, we are to be subject to whatever happens, whoever is elected. Um, Obama was my president. Even though I didn't, you know, vote for him, I didn't stand for the, especially the moral laws, which, you know, they're instituting in the land. Biden was not my president. Then you hear all these people say, well, Trump's not my president. Trump was, Trump was all our presidents, <laughs> you know, and we needed to respect the office of the land and respect the process. And so, you know, it's one of those things is you, you, you obey if just for the subjectivity of being under the authority and for conscious sake. Um, we see a few instances actually of Jesus take, talking about paying tribute when in his ministry rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's 
Uh, even in Matthew chapter 17, when he was not officially required to pay tribute there in Cap Capernaum, he still instructed Peter to go and get the money out of the fish's mouth, and he paid tribute there in Capernaum. He wasn't officially even uh, obligated to. And he says, Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. And so, I, again, I, I do believe that the Christian should be the country's best citizen. And like I said, it, it angers me uh, with the policies that we see, but I am to be obedient to the law of the land unless it is in direct violation with the law of God. Because you are not going to demonstrate yourself as a person of God if you're just out here in a foaming fit rage and you just, you're just beside yourself throwing who knows what at other things. You know, and that's the thing is uh, I find myself hating haters. <laughs> but then I'm like, am I hating? Because I'm hating haters. You know, and so it's, it's one of those things that you, you just get sick of it. You get sick of the, the protests going bad and who knows who's getting paid to be there to antagonize the other side. It's probably happening on both sides. And like I tell, you know, Jason, uh, uh, and I keep bringing you up, son, but we, we have been talking about this a lot because we've been talking about the, you know, there is corruption wherever there's power. There always will be. But God has blessed the United States right now is above any, every other nation with the freedom we can come and assemble in his name and not be persecuted. We, we are not under Shia law or, you know, or Shiites or whatever it is that we have to uh, worship um, uh, Muhammad and worship Allah. You know, uh, a friend of mine, well, he was a co-worker of mine, and he was an uh, Arabic Muslim. And I know I've given this illustration before, but, you know, it's people will, will try to tell you that Islam is a peaceable religion, peaceable religion. And this man was fantastic. He's, I mean, he was, he was nice. He was kind. Everybody loved him. But he told me directly that, um, is it the, uh, I forgot, I forgot, what's the Islam Bible called again? The Torah, Korah, no, uh, that's wrong. I forgot what it's called. But anyway, their, their Bible, and this is going to, somebody, somebody Google that, Google that. Um, because Koran, thank you. I, th thank you, yes, the Koran. I wasn't going to let that go. I, I was going to, that was going to bug me. Um, they, it teaches that their missionaries are to go into a country, and they are to be peaceable, but they are to um, persuade the king or whoever the president is to enforce their religion as um, mandatory. And if they do not, then they get violent. And so that, you know, and so it's kind of a half-truth when they say it's a peaceful religion. It's a peaceful religion up until the point where if you do not declare uh, this law, the she Shia law or Shiite or whatever it's called, then they start getting upset and aggressive. And so we live in a wonderful country. We have freedom to assemble, and you're not going to find that anywhere else. I mean, wherever there's not a democracy, there's a lot of places that the Lord's not blessing. Um, in verses 8 through 10, we're moved on to the second subject, and this is Christian debt. So we saw our Christian responsibility to the government. I know we went by quickly. But now we look at 8 through 10, and we see uh, concerning Christian debt. It says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Now back up at verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. You will never be settled on your love. You'll always owe a love debt. 
Isn't that what it says? Owe no man anything except love. I owe you to love you. Uh, For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. We are to pay our debts, what we owe. But when it comes to love, there's a debt that's never settled. Um, You know, and that is one thing that is, that's a verse that convicts me sometimes, and I know it convicts you, but as, as much as we can, I can tell you right now, it, it really does hurt the, the mind and the soul to be in debt, and money-wise. I mean, I would love to be out of debt. <laughs> um, and as much as as in us, owe no man anything. You know, it, it's going to be hard to save up for a house, and pay it straight out. It really is. You'd have to wait 30 years, right? <laughs> if you're going to save that much money, I mean, that's how, how long a mortgage is. So, I mean, it, it's hard. That's a very hard verse, verse 8, to have. And um, if you can, every, anything that's in you, let's, let's pay off our debts and then worry about uh, being, you know, giving. Um, For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And so if you truly, and I love this, for this, and it goes on to talk about the commandments, but in verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to want to steal from him. I'm not going to want to, you know, commit adultery with his wife. I'm not going to want to uh, bear false witness against my neighbor. So that's how love fulfills the law is, you know, if you, it prevents you from sinning against them. In verse 11 through 14, we have the last one, the Christian incentive. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So there's our incentive. That's how we are to walk. That's how we are to find the power of the Holy Spirit, to walk this way, to walk as a Christian should walk, to walk towards another in love. I mean, there's going to be, there could be cases where, you know, you do have someone who is dishonest towards you. And uh, we, we, we're not going to talk about it right now. It's, well, it's in Corinthians where we don't take each other to uh, the courts. You know, we settle our matters here in the church. You don't take one church member to a court room. Um, we see that we are to, and it says we are in verse 11, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. We really need to step back and remember who we are and how we are different than the world. Um, wantonness, here in verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering. Uh, wantonness is unbridled lust. It's an excess of lust. That's wantonness. Chambering is defiling your bed with fornication or adultery, and not in strife and envying. You know, and really, you start talking about the how love fulfills the law. Well, you know, thankfulness to the Lord and being content with what you have fulfills strife and envying, or fulfills uh, covetousness. You know, it's real hard to have a covetous and envying spirit if you're thankful. When you're thankful, you're thankful for what the Lord's given you, and you're content. Uh, I learned that lesson real the hard way, and I had just started at Keeney at my job, and, you know, I was driving a little rust bucket, you know, just pitter-pooting along in the parking lot, uh, parking next, in, next to Lexuses and Mercedes, and remember, April, how I talked about that? I had the worst car in the parking lot. And I got to where I was so embarrassed, and then the Lord, he just he hurt my heart right there. And he goes, Philip, you're not being thankful for what you have. And as soon as I did that, yeah, you, got, you have joy. Nobody's got time for those 
you know, nuisance feelings to go through life with, keeping up with the Jones and things of that nature. And, you know, not to say that I, you know, I perfectly accepted that every day you know, because the same feeling would come back. And then one day, finally, somebody drove in a junker worse than mine. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yes, finally, relief. No. But I, I will tell you this, um, you know, and, and wonderful, the Lord. Uh, and I, you know, this principle is true. When you need grace in the most, you know, when, when you really feel the, the relief of the Lord's presence, his provision, how he's provided for you, uh, we were barely, barely making it, uh, April and I. And we had a daughter, and we needed insurance, and the job that I had, that they went out of business and, and everything. And then, the, you know, I, the Lord led me to, to I, I answered a newspaper ad, and then once they fi- hired me full time, and I remember sitting down at a meal. I had, you know, I decided not to bring a sandwich from home and things like that and bought a meal at the Civic Center. I don't even know what it's called now, but it used to be the Civic Center. And I sat down at that meal, and I thank God, like I've never thanked God for that meal before in my life. Because, I'm, I mean, I knew what it cost. I knew what it meant. The Lord had provided and, you know, it's hard sometimes to, you take for granted what the Lord has provided for us. And really, that's who we ought to remember who we are. We're, we're, we're children of the King. You know, we, we do, our conversation is in heaven. It's not here. Right. You know, we're citizens of heaven. We are to behave as citizens of heaven while we're here. This is a pilgrimage. That means that we're not staying here. We're just passing through. This isn't our permanent address. And so as we pass through, let's bring glory to God. Let's remember uh, how we are to act, you know, knowing that, and that's what chapter 12 and chapter 13 really are connected. Understanding who we are devoted to. We're devoted to God in chapter 12. And then how to act as a church member to one another. We are to love one another. And then how to love uh, those who are outside of the church. And then finally, submission to the government. And be careful not to owe anybody debt. And then we see here the incentive that we have um, in Colossians, and then we'll close Colossians chapter 3. You all probably quote this. And um, I did have written down, you you can write it down if if you are taking notes. We we won't go to it, but it's Romans chapter 6, 12 through 14. How it talks to us about not letting sin reign in our mortal body, that we should obey it and the lust thereof. But look at Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 5. If ye then, Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 5, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek Christ. Those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, he's our life, right? Shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members. You know, it's so funny how some people say this is like church members. No, don't, mortify means to kill. <laughs> don't, don't kill the church members which are upon the earth. Mortify your members, which is the flesh. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. Kill them. Kill it. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. And covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. That's how we are to live our Christian life. And I love Romans chapter 13. And it stays consistent and the teachings to the epistles, how we are be the subject to higher powers, and we see the example which Christ gave. Let's give nobody an occasion to accuse us. 
Let no one give you an occasion to accuse us, unless it is preaching the gospel, unless it's declaring the gospel. And then, happy are we if we're afflicted. Happy are we if we're persecuted by the government. We are to obey God rather than man, because our life is hid in Christ, who is our life. And so that's what our life is supposed to represent, is uh, being a Christian. Amen. Well, that's all I have for tonight. I hope the Lord's richly blessed you. Let's all stand. Brother Chapman, we'll...